Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you to everyone joining us today from across the country and around the world. I'm Michael Higgs with Conscious Capitalism. Uh, we appreciate you taking time to learn and grow in community with us today. Today, we're joined by Gary Ridge to explore how values drive culture to bring focus, innovation, and success. As many of you know, Conscious Capitalism is a philosophy that emphasizes the human nature of capitalism and business. It is a movement of business leaders around the world working together to change the practice and perception of capitalism and elevate humanity. And Conscious Capitalism is a nonprofit organization dedicated to catalyzing that movement. Every week we're offering virtual gatherings as a way for the community to see how this philosophy takes shape in the leadership journeys and the business practices of those in our network. Today's gathering will run for about 45 minutes. We will hear from Gary Ridge for about 30 minutes, and then we're gonna to transition to questions during the last 15 or so minutes of our session. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And if you have any technical questions or issues, please email us at info at consciouscapitalism.org. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Gary Ridge is the chairman and CEO of the WD-40 company. He joined the WD-40 company in 1987 and held various leadership positions in the company before being appointed to the CEO in 1997. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of San Diego, where he teaches the principles and practices of corporate culture in the Masters of Science in Executive Leadership Program. He's passionate about the learning, growing, and empowering of the organizational culture he's helped establish at the WD-40 company. In 2009, he co-authored a book with Ken Blanchard outlining his effective leadership techniques titled Helping People Win at Work, a business philosophy called Don't Mark My Paper, Help Me Get an A. A native of Australia, Gary Ridge holds a certificate in modern retailing and wholesale distribution and a master's of science in effective, excuse me, executive leadership from the University of San Diego. Welcome, Gary Ridge. Thank you so much for being here this morning with us. Hey, Michael, how are you today? I'm having a wonderful morning, Gary. Thank you, it's great to be with you. And I'm delighted to, to be with your group here today to talk about something that, as you said, I'm really passionate about and that's people. So I'm going to uh, share my screen, hopefully so people can see. And um, hopefully you can see my screen being shared now and talk about, um, some of the practices and principles that we see are important as we talk about the importance of people in an organization. So back, you know, I, I have a, a true belief that pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. And I wish that I had come to that conclusion myself, but actually Aristotle, who was born in 384 BC said that. And I believe that, that it's absolutely true that we all do something better if we really enjoy doing it. During my talk today, I'd like to also introduce you to someone. This is Al, I call him the soul sucking CEO. And I'll share some of his behaviors later that actually um, turn organizations into organizations where people don't go home happy. Just recently, a good friend of mine, uh, Hubert Jolet, who was the CEO of Best Buy wrote a book called um, in his book, The, the, the Heart of Business. And, and there was some research he quoted in that, which again, really emphasized to me the importance of understanding that the will of the people is important. And ADP Research Institute surveyed over 1900 workers in 19 countries. And the sad news is that only 16% of people are fully engaged to work, which means eight out of 10 people uh, merely show up for work. And millions of people are denied the chance to be inspired at work and do their very best. What is really sad is the cost of this to business. They estimate this is uh, about a cost of seven trillion in lost productivity. But to me, it's more important than the, the, the cost. It's the impact that we're having on people. And I often, we say, 
at, at our company, at WD-40 company, imagine a place where you go to work each day, you make a contribution to something bigger than yourself. You learn something new, you feel safe and are protected and provided freedom by a set of values and you go home happy. And why, go, why is going home happy really important? Happy people create happy families. Happy families create happy communities. Happy communities create happy countries. And, a hap and, and by God, we need a happy country. So what I'd like to do is just share with you some of the learning we've had over 20 years and a model that we've used to create a place where 98% of people who work at WD-40 companies say they love to tell people they work at our company. Now, the, the data that I'm gonna share with you around engagement today is something that we've been collecting for over 20 years. We've started doing employee opinion surveys back in the year 2000. We've done them every year. We have an employee engagement of 93%. So let's think about the four things you need to be in business as we understand it. You need people, you need purpose, passion, and products. Interestingly, passion is not something that you get issued in an envelope when you first join the organization. Passion is something that's created. So this is the model that I put together back in 1999-2000 uh, as a final piece of work when I actually did my master's degree at USD. And the things that became clear to me were to have an organization that creates an atmosphere where people actually enjoy going to work, you have to have people as your number one uh, aim of objective. It's all about the people. And we call that our tribal culture. Then you have to have a purpose or a why. Why do we go to work each day? You have to have a compelling set of values that are clearly defined and they're not there to uh, in any way inhibit the people's behavior. They're there to protect them and set them free. And then, of course, any business organization has to have a good strategy and be bold executors. I call this the typhoon zone. Why do I call it the typhoon zone? Because most organizations get out of balance. They spend far too much time in the strategy execution think mode and not enough time in the people, purpose, and values mode. And then finally, you need to have an organization that is curious and just hungry for learning. And we have that at our company because we have what we call learning moments. This model sits on four pillars of care, candor, accountability, and responsibility. Care is you care enough about your people to ensure that you're there not to mark their paper, but to help them get an A, to help them step into the best version of their personal selves. Candor to us is no lying, no faking, no hiding. I believe most people don't lie. I believe people, because of fear, fake and hide. Accountability is very clear. Are we clear about what we expect from each other? And responsibility is what we call our maniac pledge, which I'll share with you in a moment. But let me touch on reducing fear for a moment. Reducing fear is all about not making mistakes, but having learning moments. We don't make mistakes at WD-40 Company. We have learning moments and we have plenty of them. And the definition of a learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared to benefit all people. So learning is, the, is, is absolutely a core to our organization. So let's look at the three pillars that we have of, of purpose, our why, how we do that, our how, which are two really big elements of building a, a enduring culture over time. So many of you probably know our blue and yellow can with a little red top. So if I said, asked you what you think our purpose is, you might say that our purpose is to stop squeaks. Well, that purpose really doesn't meet the desire of people of what, what a real purpose to us is. So our purpose is we're in the memories business. We exist to create positive lasting memories in everything we do. We solve problems, we make things work smoothly, and we create opportunity. That's the purpose. That's why we go to work each day. How we do that is we create positive lasting memories by cultivating a tribal culture of learning and teaching, which produces a highly engaged workforce who live our company's values every day. Our what is simply what we do. Our mission is to deliver unique, 
high value, easy to use solutions for a wide variety of maintenance needs in workshops and factories and homes. We market and distribute our brands, in fact, in 176 countries across the, the world. So everybody gets to touch what we do. So having a clear purpose and ours is around memories. Culture to us is reasonably simple. And I adapted this equation from some of the work of Simon Sinek and his book, The Infinite Game. Culture equals parentheses values plus behavior, close parentheses times consistency. And it means it happens when. So values in the organization, as I shared, are the written reminders of how you can be set free and what you're gonna hold yourself accountable for. Behavior, we have to have leaders who love our people enough and care about our people enough, not only to praise them and, and recognize them for great work, but also to redirect their behavior when it's not aligned with our values. And you've got to do it every day, every day, every day. We have a very simple just cause. We help make life better at work and at home. What do I mean by that? We help make life better at work for the tribe members who come to work every day by creating this place where they can learn something new and make a contribution to building memories. And we make life better at work for the people who use our product every day. And at home for both also. By making life better at work, we make life better at home for our tribe members and of course for the users of our product around the world. So let's take a moment to think about values. And values to us, and I love what Seth Godin says about this. He says, people like us do things like this. Our values are the common cornerstone of WD-40. They are the beliefs that are at the core of what they do and they give us a common ground for decision-making and guide us as we apply our philosophies and judgment to our work. Values allow us to express our unique personalities and cultures in a common, comfortable way. Our values are the cornerstone of how we think about WD-40. Here are our values. And I'm going to go through each one of those just in a little bit of detail. But I'd like to make the point here that our values are hierarchical. So the number one value is more powerful than number six. And you would think that would be unusual. WD-40 companies are public companies. But our number six value is we value sustaining the WD-40 economy, which is the economic engine that drives our business, that allows us to do the things we do every day. You may want to have that as our number one value, because without it, we can't survive. To us, it's the outcome of living the other five. If we live the other five values, we will sustain the WD-40 economy. What I want to point out with each of these values, and I'm not going to read each one of these descriptions, but what it's something that is very, very, very important to us. It's not just the words we value doing the right thing. Because we're a global company, we need to describe what doing the right thing means. So each one of our values has a description that can be interpreted no matter where you live in the world. So in this case, we do the right thing by, by serving our tribe mates, our stockholders and our customers, our product, the people who consume our products, our suppliers and even our competitors. So as you'll see, as we look at each one of these values, each description makes it clear to our tribe members globally what's important to us. So doing the right thing, our number one value described the way in this slide. Interesting. Our number two value is we value creating positive lasting memories in all of our relationships, which ties directly into the, the purpose or our why statement. So we want our interactions, whether they're with our customers or with our, our end users, our, our vendors, even our competitors, we want to create that positive lasting memory. Very important. We value making it better than it is today we strive for continual improvement. We are a learning organization. Our third value lay, lays directly again into the how. It, it really does reinforce the fact that we are a learning organization. We value succeeding as a tribe while excelling as individuals. So we recognize our collective success comes first. 
Our organization is a global company with many different locations and tribe members spread all wide around the world. But it's us coming together for our collective success while striving as individuals that is so important. We value owning it and passionately acting on it. I love the opening description of this. We get our shoes dirty. We're relentless about understanding our business and our role in, and how we impact it. We are passionate about our end users, our customers, and how we can positively impact them. We act in ways that maintain our traditions while positioning ourselves powerfully for, powerfully for the future. We consider carefully, we act boldly, and we course correct as needed. I like the words strategic, pragmatic, collaborative, and disciplined. We value sustaining the WD40 company is our final value. We exist to create and protect the economic value of all our tribe members. There's been a lot of talk recently about stakeholders and who, what is a stakeholder. And it's a group of people who without their support, the company would likely not exist. So we're there to support those stakeholders. I talked a little earlier about responsibility. And again, we have a way of describing responsibility and here it is. It's called our maniac pledge. I am responsible for taking action, asking questions, getting answers and making decisions. I won't wait for someone to tell me. If I need to know, I'm responsible for asking. I have no right to be offended that I didn't get this sooner. And if I'm doing something others should know about, I'm responsible for telling them. This is a pledge we all take to ourselves. I've talked a little bit about the importance of a tribe and our tribal philosophy is really based on Maslow's hierarchy to self-actualization. One of the biggest desires we have as human beings is to belong. Maslow's hierarchy says in the first two rungs, can we eat and are we safe? But the third one is love or belonging. And this is where a lot of organizations fall down. My dear friend and mentor, Ken Blanchard says, it's sad that most people know that doing a good job only because no one yelled at them today. That's not what happens at our tribe. We call ourselves a tribe. Our employees are tribe members. As individuals and as an organization, we aspire to live up to the behaviors of, of a tribe. Our tribal promise is a group of people who come together to protect and feed each other. So why am I showing you a boomerang? Well, as you know, I, I'm an Aussie. But one of the things we did when we looked at tribalism was not saying that we are like any particular individual group, but what are the behaviors that, that are tribal over time? So I took a look at the, the indigenous Australians and the Fijian Islanders and looked at what are these attributes. And one of the things that became very clear to me was the importance of learning and teaching. If we were to take a time tunnel back and observe a group of indigenous Australians meeting thousands of years ago, what would the tribal leader be doing? the tribal leader would be teaching them to throw a boomerang. Why? Because the boomerang was the tool of survival. And so if we think about our tribal attributes, here they are. The number one responsibility we have as a tribal leader is to be a learner and a teacher. Number two is to ensure we have a set of values. Number three is to ensure that we create a, a community of belonging, that we're future focused, that we, that we recognize specialized skills, that we're warriors, and that we celebrate. So let me touch on Al for a moment. I introduced you to him earlier. You know, Al would say, what if we invest in our people and they leave? And thank goodness, a servant leader would say, what if we don't and they stay? So what are the bad habits that Al has that don't create these, this atmosphere? Well, Al is a master of control. He's a know-it-all. Al thinks he's corporate royalty. Al thinks learning is for losers. Al, his ego eats his empathy instead of his empathy eating his ego. Al has all the answers. Why does he need anybody else? The soul-sucking CEO, Al, must always be right. He loves a, or she loves a fear-based culture. Micromanagement is essential. They don't follow through on their commitments and they hate feedback. So contrast that to the conscious capital leader, the servant leader, they lead, those leaders involve and love their people. They're always in servant leadership mode. They're, they are expected to be competent. They are connected with emotional intelligence. Their ego doesn't eat their empathy. 
Their empathy eats their ego. They love learning moments. They have a heart of gold and a backbone of steel. They are champions of hope. They know micromanagement isn't scalable. They do what they say they're going to do and they treasure the gift of feedback. So what I've shared with you in this first 20 or so minutes is really some of the principles and practices and philosophies we've had at WD40 Company over the last 20 years. So you might say, Gary, so what? Does that, what does that create? Well, I'm proud to share with you some of the results of our employee opinion surveys. We have a 93% a employee engagement. 98% of our people say they love to tell people they work at WD40 Company. Globally, 95% of the people say they know what results are expected of them. They feel their opinions and values are a good fit with the company, 97%. They respect their coach, 97%. Now, who's their coach? Their coach is their leader, their manager. We don't have managers in the company. We have coaches because a coach's role is to help the player play their best game. And 94% of people in the company are excited about the company's future. So if I go back to my original theory that pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work and that employee engagement is what I would call the will of the people, here's a very simple equation we could work on. Let's say that we have a strategy in the business and it's been graded at 70 out of 100, a fantastic strategy. However, the will of the people is 10 or maybe 16, as we saw in some of that research from the ADB. Research Institute. So if you had a low will of the people and a good strategy, the power of 10 as far as will and strategy of 700, your output would be seven, of 70 would be 700. But what if we had the high will of the people, the high determination, passionate people going to work every day, making contributions to things bigger than themselves, learning something new, and more importantly, going home happy. 80 times 70 is 5,600. So, you know, our, I, I believe in what Drucker said. He says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I say, great culture makes breakfast a feast. Now, the other side of that is about financial performance. So you've got a company that has very high employee engagement. People love working there, but is it successful? Well, I'd have to share yes. Over the past 20 years, we've increased our revenue 5x. We now we operate in 176 countries around the world. Oh, and by the way, we're a public company. Our market cap's gone from 350 million to 3.5 billion, which really takes me to what I know to be true because it's not about a theory, it's about a practical application. And here's what I know to be true. Purpose-driven, passionate people guided by their values, create amazing outcomes. Our job is to make sure we create an environment where our tribe members wake up each day inspired to go to work. They feel safe while they are there and they return home at the end of the day, fulfilled by the work they do, feeling they've learned something new and contributed to something bigger than themselves. This is the world we envision. If we create this world for our people, they will take care of our customers and that will in turn take care of our stakeholders. One of my favorite leaders is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And we can do this. Business today, leadership today has the biggest opportunity ever to make a positive difference on the world. And all we need to do is to not be the owl, but be the servant leader. So it's, I've been delighted to have the opportunity in my 30 minutes this morning to share, not me, my wonderful tribe and what they've done because the real introduction I should have had was, hi, I'm Gary Ridge. I'm the consciously incompetent, probably wrong, and roughly right chairman and CEO of WD40 Company. If you want to learn more about some of the work and my publications, uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and go back to uh, you, Michael, for the question time. Wonderful, Gary. Thank you so much for the uh, compelling presentation. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'll go ahead and kick it off with a uh, with a question. Um, 
you know, one of the things you mentioned is that the WD-40 company is a, a it's a learning organization. People don't make mistakes um, and every opportunity, or I should say that every mistake, quote, uh, is, a, is a learning moment. Um, how do you structure those learning moments? If, 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 the, if the organization acknowledges that, you know, um, maybe something isn't going as planned or expected, um, how is that acknowledged and how do you sort of course correct? as an organization? Well, first thing is, as I said, is you have to have clear accountability for what you're trying to achieve. So, you know, if I say our, our a measurement of success is we're going to drive from San Diego to San Francisco and we end up um, in Seattle, the question is, why did we end up in Seattle? What was the learning moment? And the answer to that is, well, we took a wrong turn along the way and we didn't follow the map or we got diverted because the road got, um, but built, you know, got destroyed through a landslide. So number one is, what, what, what's, what are we holding each other? What does an A look like? And then reflecting on what was the outcome and then looking at what did we learn? Because we're going to learn it from every situation. So accountability, openness, transparency, and again, taking that candor that I shared, no lying, no faking, no hiding. Most people don't lie. People fake and hide because of fear and the reason learning moment or the learning moment philosophy doesn't work in most organizations is because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of actually being able to share why I took that wrong turn or why the avalanche closed the road along the way. Thank you. Um, next question is, uh, what is your onboarding process um, from leadership uh, and throughout the company that helps set new tribe members up for success um, at WD40 um, because it, you know working at WD40 may be very different from some of their prior uh, professional experiences. So, so what is onboarding process and how do you sort of set people up for success? Our onboarding process, Michael, starts at our careers page on our website where it says, here are the WD40 company values and here's what they stand for. And if you are not aligned with these, don't call us because you won't be happy here. So that's where our, our onboarding starts. And then from that, there's a whole program of, you know, I, I said to uh, some of our uh, organizational development people a few weeks ago, my goodness, I'm glad I'm not applying for a job at WD-40 these days because this is rigorous. I probably wouldn't get the job, but, but we focus very much on the value fit within the organization. If you fit within our values and, and you, we, can, we have ways of, determining that during the, the, the process, we can teach you just about anything. So of course, you've got to come into a specific skill with you know, the basic needs or even advanced needs. But then from day one, it's all about how does the tribe support you to be successful? If you join the company tomorrow, it would not be unusual for you to get 150 to 200 welcome emails from all around the world saying, welcome to our tribe. We're glad you're here. How can I help you be successful? We're not here to mark your paper. We're here to help you get an A. Now, WD-40 is a great company, but it's not for everybody because people don't like sometimes clarity, accountability, care, candor, the brave, the, the way to be brave enough to love your people and redirect them. Some people don't like that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you for the questions that are being submitted via, uh, via the Q&A feature, if you have any. Uh, feel free to type those in and uh, time provided. We have about 15 minutes left. Uh, we will get Gary to answer those. I'm going to take a question from Tamara. Uh, Gary, she asks, can you share an example where you felt like you had purpose-driven, passionate people, but the business outcomes weren't being realized? What did you do? Um, I guess COVID would be a great example of that. Um, where we had purpose-driven, passionate people and come you know, March 13th last year, someone turned off the business switch around the world. So the desired outcome that we wanted was very uncertain. And uncertainty is a series of future events that may or may not occur. So I think one of the great learnings we got out of COVID was being thrown into uncertainty. But one of the powerful things that came from that was our tribe that 
said, our promise is, is a group of people that come together to protect and feed each other. And uh, we had three very clear goals from day one. The first one was the safety and the well-being of our, our tribe members globally. That was our number one priority. Mm -hmm. And number two was taking care of our customers, being able to support their needs. And number three was how do we protect the business infrastructure to reset and thrive when we come out of that? So I think my learning from that was if you have a group of people that come in with a, a strong culture, even though it may look for a period of time that the, the future is uncertain, you can get through it. Now, let me give you a really interesting statistic around that. Um, about halfway through uh, COVID, uh, we were thinking about our tribal cultural equity. You know, it wasn't draining because suddenly we were spread apart. We weren't together anymore. So we went out and, and we, we did a check-in around our, our employee engagement measurements. Now, in this time, we'd learned to be different. We'd become virtual. We understood that the Brady Bunch was not a television show anymore. It was a screen we looked at every day. But we went out and we, we tested our, our, cultural, um, uh, our cultural engagement again. In my slide, I, I shared with you that 94% of people in March 2019, before COVID, said they were excited about the WD-40 company future. In January 2020, that went to 98%. So in the middle of COVID, people were more excited about our future than they were before COVID. And the question is why? And here's what the feedback was. If we can get through this together, we can get through anything together because we're living our tribal promise of a group of people who come together to protect and feed each other. Isn't that absolutely amazing? That is powerful. Um, that's kind of sort of sets up a uh, next question here from uh, Bob Gary. Um, Bob asks, uh, what's the most important learning moment that you share with tribe members? Oh, the three most important words I learned in my life. I don't know. And getting really comfortable with being consciously incompetent and probably wrong and roughly right. Um, and, you know, Al, the soul-sucking CEO, must always be right. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm fortunate that I get to stand on the shoulders of giants every day. And we are who we are at WD-40 Company today, not because of me. I planted a seed. Our, our, our tribe grew the tree. And now we all sit under it. So my biggest learning moment was we're getting really uncomfortable with the three most powerful words I've ever met and learned in my life. I don't know. Thank you, Gary. Um, next question is from Anita. Um, she asks, uh, will you please talk about diversity and inclusion at WD40 and how that sort of fits into, um, you know, your, your approach to business, the sort of conscious approach? Sure. You know, one of the great benefits we have as being global is being diversity. We have more people outside of the United States than in the United States. There's nothing more exciting than getting on a, a team's uh, a meeting with people from France, Germany, Spain, Italy, China, Australia, the UK, you name it in countries around the world. And I believe that to be a company that is truly serving its stakeholders, we should reflect those that we serve. And we serve so many different organizations, so many different cultures and genders and choices. Um, you know, we, we have, we were one of the first companies to have a, a, um, four female board members on our board of directors. We've always had females on there. We have diverse um, uh, 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 cultures on our board. So our board should reflect the people we serve. So I love the fact of that. Um, I have a beautiful story about not only diversity, but about developing people. We opened a subsidiary in mainland China about 14 years ago. Our first local employee, Grace, uh, joined us. She was an admin uh, as assisting the, the person we'd sent there to set up the, um, um, the organization. 
fast forward over time, Grace had a, a, a passion for supply chain and other areas. We helped develop her. We, sent, we helped support her through education at the Shanghai University. Today, our first employee in China, Grace, is the country manager of our, one of our biggest opportunity markets in the world. And I have many stories like that where we've helped develop people because our job is to help people step into the best version of their personal self. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we live our values, then we'll do that. You don't make very many positive lasting memories if you don't respect the culture and diversity of the people within your organization. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, Gary, is a question from Neil. And uh, Neil asks, how do you ensure you don't have rogue leaders who are not on board with servant leadership? You have a Zero big tolerance. Company. Zero tolerance. Zero tolerance. That's it. You know, uh, remember I said the, the, the cultural equation, culture equals values plus behaviors time consistency. You have to be brave enough to be able to redirect behavior that's not in line with your values and your culture. And you have to do it consistently. When I went to school in Australia, I went into a science class. My science teacher gave me a Petri dish and we grew culture in that Petri dish. So how did you grow culture? You put stuff in there. And what did my science teacher tell me? You watch that Petri dish every day. And if toxins get in there, that are gonna destroy the ability to grow the culture, you either have to put an antibody in to fix the culture or the toxin, or you have to extract it. So zero tolerance. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is a question from uh, Jesus. And Jesus asks, uh, how, do you how do you transmit the passion, Gary, that you're exuding to your, your employees? And do you, like, do you have mechanisms to sort of promote passion within the organization? Well, it's driven by our purpose. Who tell me who doesn't want to get up every day and help create positive lasting memories? And we get that feedback. You know, here's the di difference in this, Michael. If our, if our just cause or our why was to stop squeaks, that's, free, that's, that's not very passionate dri dri driving. But every day we hear from our end users and our people that we've helped them create a positive lasting memory. And at the end of the day, memories are all you have. You know, I don't know how many times I've got on an airplane or I've been somewhere and someone say, what do you do? I say, I work for WD-40. And what do they say? I remember when. I remember when I was working on my bicycle with my grandfather with a can of WD-40. I remember when. I remember when. So our job is to create these, these experiences for people by delivering product that creates these memories. Or... When a tribe member is touched by a behavior that they, that they remember within the organization, I remember when someone actually said thank you to me. And that's the problem today is with, you know, Al, the soul-sucking CEO, is too busy feeding his, his or her ego instead of, you know, actually respecting and, and treasuring the people. You know, I love... Um, I, uh, Bob Chapman from Barry Weinmiller says that uh, everybody who comes to work each day is someone's precious child. I would say they're someone's precious child, they're someone's precious husband, wife, brother, sister, auntie, uncle. And we should respect them for that. Wonderful. Um, so I want to go, I want to actually circle back to um, the zero tolerance policy um, because you, you mentioned redirecting behavior. And Tamara is asking a question, can you share a story about redirecting behavior and retaining that person? You know, how do you handle it when a tribe member seems to be struggling to, to get one of the values or aspects of the culture? Um, yeah, I got a lovely story for you. It, it, and it relates to our second value. We value creating positive lasting memories in all of our relationships. So some time back, you know, we're in a leadership meeting and there was someone in the room that wasn't creating positive lasting memories. They were having a really bad day. Um, they were, you know, they weren't respecting the people in the room. They weren't delivering, you know, the type of, of collaborative yet um, edge driven conversations we like. We call it servant leadership with edge. 
you know, it's not about kumbaya and hugging each other. It's about respecting each other and being able to share our point of view. So at the end of the meeting, I said to this person, and I'll call them Michael, just because you're on with me here, Michael. I said, hey, Michael, let's go for a walk. So we walked out of our building. And I went over and I looked in a trash can, I looked behind a car, I looked behind a tree, and I could see Michael getting more and more frustrated. And Michael says, what the hell are you doing? I said, Michael, I'm looking for you. The Michael I know and love was not in that room today. The Michael I know and love was not living one of our values today. What's on your mind? What's getting in your way? And Michael shared with me, Michael had had a bad morning. Anyhow, we were able to have a coaching session immediately around that. Michael went back into the, the building later that day and I saw him. He went to the folks that were um, in that meeting and, and he, um, he shared that he was having a bad morning and he apologised. What, what did I observe the next day? Those people were going to Michael and what were they asking Michael? Hey, Mike, how's things? You okay today? How can I support you? Is everything okay? So by acting immediately around what the behaviour was and what we wanted it to be, but more importantly, we were able to use, which we do every day, our values as the foundation for that conversation. So that's why values are so important. Gary, we have about two minutes remaining, and I wonder if we have time for one more question. I do want to respect your schedule. Um, Final question is what organiz what what organization uh, organizational tools or methodology does WD40 utilize to gather data and conduct surveys, and and who creates the questions the employees answer? Okay, so our employee opinion survey uh, we've been using the same company for over twenty years. A company in San Diego called Peter Barron Stark and Associates. Uh, they uh, work with a number of companies around employee engagement and gathering of the data. So now we, we do the survey. It's all electronic. It's done in seven languages. It's completely confidential. Oh, interestingly enough, we get about 96% of our global tribe actually participate. And the reason why is they, they know and they see that we actually do something with what they share with us. Wonderful. Well, Gary, um... Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights as, as a leader um, and giving us a window into, uh, into the WD40 company. I mean, there were some remarkable insights. I can tell by the questions that are continuing to come into the Q&A that uh, I, your, 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 um, your presentation was very well received. Um, so again, thank you. I do want to just say to those attendees that are with us, um, if you could just take 30 seconds to fill out the survey in the chat box, um, that does help us with, with future programming. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about conscious capitalism, please visit consciouscapitalism.org. We have some more information about our movement um, and our organization. And uh, we hope to see you at our next session. And Gary, again, thank you again for your time today.